Alrighty, on this episode of Faith and Focus, I want to talk a little bit about kind of something again in the theme of things that I've been talking about. It's it's an issue that I've been thinking about for a long time, and a, a lot of friends and I we we spend time talking about the, the church and the and the health of the church in America. And I always tell people that I know, and I try to preface in, in things like this that um, I, I try to not I try to speak on these issues with with a, hopefully a spirit of humility. Um, and I'm naturally cynical by nature and, and I can be snarky and sarcastic and, and, um, in my flesh, I can tend towards that. So, and I think in the past, my, uh, my, posi- my position on, on, on the church and, and being critical and not critical in a positive way, but critical of the church has come from an attitude of cynicism and a lot of it, a lot of my hope in ministry was to transform and fix all the problems that I saw in the American church. And it, it was a, several years ago that the Lord really challenged me with this idea that, you know, first of all, that's not my job to feel the need to reform the church. Uh, I've done an earlier podcast on, on here called uh, he who walks among the lampstands or something like that. And it's Jesus in Revelation who's walking among the lampstands. He's the one who's, and lampstands are symbolic of the church. Revelation tells us that. So uh, it's Jesus' job to walk amongst the lampstand and, and be amongst the churches. And he's the one writing the letters in Revelation to, to critique the church. So, so that's really his job. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean we stick our head in the ground and don't notice uh problems but but I was overly critical a, a lot of the time with the church and it was kind of from an attitude of and I don't know why I thought this it was kind of humbling to realize what do I know what I, I don't know what I'm talking about but it was from an attitude of you know I know better and that really the Lord had to humble me in that that uh, first of all it's not my job to criticize it wouldn't be my job Really, what he challenged me on was if the bride, if the church is the bride of Christ. I mean, imagine if you, if you're a husband who's got a wife, or if you're a wife and you're and you're with your husband, or if you've just got friends who are married. Just imagine what it would be like to, in front of the husband, be criticizing the wife and talking about how terrible she is and stuff. The husband wouldn't stand for that. So you know, it's that's not to say that what you might be saying might or may or may not be true, but that's not really your job, and it's a little rude to do that. So certainly. Uh, far be it from me to think that it's my job to fix the American church. And that's really where God humbled me saying, first of all, you don't even know what you're doing. It's kind of like a Jordan Peterson type rebuke. It's like, make your bed and clean your room first before you decide to try to change the American church. And so I I recognize that, Hey, I've got my own problems. I've got my own issues. Maybe my role in the body of Christ is just to hopefully, um, work on the local church and, and the, and the Christians that I rub shoulders with. So, but I still think about all of these things, and I think about the issues within the church, and I try, I'm trying to, kind of from an outsider, looking at uh, the churches in America, the local churches in America, and just what I see as the trend, it, it, as kind of like just a, an observer, and I try to look at it objectively, and, and some of what I'm going to say has come out already in, in earlier podcasts, but... Some of it was sparked again by this article. It's an older article. It's several years old, but um, a friend online shared it, so I read it, and it just sparked a lot of this thinking in my head and how I think that the author doesn't really get... She's misdiagnosing, I think, or uh, because maybe she's blind to what, what the reality is of the church. But, okay, so all that to say... The church has issues. We've talked about how the church runs like a business. The church operates like a business. It, it It's just like an institution in the world system. It functions almost entirely the exact same way. Uh, bosses, the boss of a church that we might call a pastor or a CEO or a lead manager, whatever it might be, is somebody who is the, the professional. They are the ones who went to school for being in that role and really I, I I think it by and large a big problem 
that the American church faces. And again, I say this only in so much as, you know, if you're listening to this, take a look at your local church and see if, take what I'm saying and kind of compare it with your experience and what you see. And do you think, you know, there is some truth to that because I think it's, it's, it's sort of like a lot of problems. When you see it, you can't unsee it. So a lot of the church is struggling. A lot of local churches are struggling to grow. They're struggling to win people to Christ. We've talked about in the past how most church growth comes from transfer growth. So you're stealing people who are already church-going Christian people from other churches. So it's not really winning people to Christ. So that's problematic. And how many, how very few people are actually being won to Christ. And, and so the, the replacement rate, we're not at replacement rate as far as um Converts. We're, we're losing more people through death, attrition, apostasy, walking away from the faith, whatever you want to call it. People are leaving more than they're coming into the church. So, so obviously the church as a whole has a problem. And I think by and large it's because we operate like a business. Now part of us operating like a business is this uh, college pipeline for Christian work. I... And again, I, I'm somebody who has gone to Bible school. I, I've, I've got my master's degree from a seminary. And hopefully that uh, it wasn't a waste. But um, I am a strong proponent that we should we should be leading the charge as Christians. There's a big movement in our culture now because of how um, disastrous college has been. The expense of college, the cost of associated with it the the uselessness that comes from colleges the the useless classes you have to take i mean everything that you take in college could be summed down summed up in probably a years long program but because they're charging you big money they got to justify a four year degree so they shove in all this useless stuff it probably doesn't actually matter at all it's just a credentialing system so that's in the world system and most people are realizing that that's a scam and so a lot of companies are now saying we do not preference degrees. We want to see people who have experience. We want to see people who have actually know what they're doing because most people who graduate from college once you take once you get a position at a co- corporation or company in HR or something like that, the, most of the learning you have to do is on the job learning anyways. You could have just plucked somebody who maybe has nominal experience and just train them and they do just as fine. But obviously doctors would probably be an exception. You probably want somebody who knows what they're doing with the doctors. But a lot of jobs and a lot of companies are realizing, you know, a lot of these college educated people are coming out of college thinking they know everything and thinking that they are and expecting a lot because, well, we wasted all this time in college and we paid all this money. We're accumulating all this debt. So it's, it's a really bad track and a really bad bad program just people go, feeling the need to go to college so all that to say i think that the church should probably start leading the charge of saying listen we do not privilege and think that to be in ministry you have to have a bible school education now hear what i'm saying i don't i do not think that that means we should have people leading churches and teaching in churches and doing ministry who are not biblically literate. Those are two different things. You can be biblically literate and not have a Bible degree, not have gone to school for two, four, six years. Um, my cat's chasing something. Um, you can you can be b- biblically literate. So this is, of course. The classic example is you look at the early church. Peter, James, and John, they were even said, you know, by the educated, the religious, these people are uneducated men. They don't know, how, where do they get this knowledge from? They didn't They didn't go to seminary. They didn't go, th- you know, through Pharisee University. Uh, but they were with Jesus, and they learned that way. And so uh, I think that, the emphasis that we've placed because we have mirrored the world system is if a person has a desire to serve the Lord, what we do is immediately put them on the professional minister track 
and send them off to Bible school to get a Bible degree. Now, um, and I'll get to this article here, here in a second, but I'm, I'm kind of trying to lay, lay the groundwork for, for what this article, I think, helps illustrate. The, the problem with the whole system of the church functioning like a business is we've articulated it. You treat people like consumers. So it's hard to get people to, how do you win somebody to Christ as a consumer, but then try to disciple them into a, a worker It's very hard to do when you inculcate the consumer mindset. Well, going to Bible college and getting your degree to be the professional church worker it almost it kind of works against that that desire to see every person every member ministry to see every part of the body of Christ serving and ministering and using their talents within the, the body of Christ it, well, and why is that well because if i'm just the consumer if i'm just the customer at the church you went to school for this you're the professional you're the one getting the paycheck. Why are you going to ask me, like when it comes time to like, hey, we need you know somebody to lead a Bible study, you know, give up a night of your week to lead a Bible study and prepare for that. And we need somebody to meet with a couple of young guys who need to be discipled. Like, you know, like, you know, it might take, you know, several hours a week to do this. And, you know, it's going to cut into your time. Like we would think, well, why are you asking me to do that? I'm not getting paid for this. Like I have my job. You've got your job. Your job is to whatever, whatever your job is to do. So it's very difficult to get people to do ministry in the church and as a part of the church when there is a professional class that gets paid for it. And it also, it also communicates that this is something that you can only do if you're professional, if you've gone to school for. And I think that's a, I mean, that's completely wrong. I think going to Bible school may actually be a detriment sometimes. You know, there are a lot of people that that go to Bible school and come out for the worse on the other side. And well, some of it is just knowledge puffing up. I remember when I graduated from Bible college, the first go around, I mean, I came out at 21 years old thinking I knew everything. And I just think like, if I thought I knew everything at that point and I became a pastor of a church, you know, God have mercy on whoever I was pastoring because that would have been a disaster. But we do this kind of stuff. We put someone into Bible school and they come out at 23 with a with a degree and, and we think that they're just this professional whatever. And, and people th- who come out of Bible school think that because they think, well, just like, you know, Dr. Fauci might say, I'm the science. I went to, you know, science school and got my degree in science. Somebody who's went to Bible school thinks I am theology. I am, I know the Bible and you, you do not have to go to Bible school to know the Bible. (laughs) And, but, but I think what going to Bible school does is it breeds professional pastors. What do professional pastors do? They run businesses. They are professionals. So a lot of, a lot of schooling on, on being a pastor is some Bible. We want you to learn some Bible But a lot of it is business type stuff, how to plant a church, how to do demographics, how to be an entrepreneur, how to market, how to fundraise, things that would serve you just as well if you were opening up a coffee shop. You know, you got to know your demographics, you got to know your customer base, you got to know all all of that stuff. So you have these professional class Christians who are expected to be the ones who know everything who are expected to be the ones that do everything because they are the ones being paid for it, rather than what we've talked about from Ephesians 4. It's the job of the leaders of a church to train the people in the church to do the work of ministry. So if you want to talk about where does biblical literacy come from, maybe you have pastors and elders and stuff like that who have a high degree of Bible training, maybe in our culture that implies going to a school that strictly teaches the Bible, a crash course in, in serious biblical education, although I, I question whether that's necessary. But then you go back to your local church and it's your job, rather than 
sending people from your church, if your people say, well, I want to really grow in my faith and I want to serve the Lord in some way, rather than saying, well, what you need is a good seminary degree. Go off somewhere and get your pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and get taught something that probably has very little to do with the Bible. Your job then as the pastor to say, okay, I've got the Bible education. Let's sit down and I'm going to teach you the Bible. That's called discipleship in, in, in the Bible. So, Bible schools, I think, breed professional class. They they breed a distinction. You know, if somebody went to school to be an accountant, you don't then ask somebody else to do accountant work for you and not get paid for it. Like, you go to the person who's the accountant and you pay them for their time. People in the church have the same view. So, what then this breeds is then it breeds the church to function like a business because you've got the professionals, the staff, and you've got the people who are the laity, who are just there to consume. If you've been a listener of Faith and Focus for a while, I would encourage you to become a supporter of the ministry by becoming a monthly donor. Your generous donations allow me to continue working within faith and recording new content. You can find a link to my donation page in the show notes for this episode. Thank you. And so that gets to this article. It's called, Why is the Church Going Dark? And again, this was several years ago, June of 2018. But a friend just recently shared it. And I had to just screenshot it because their website had so many terrible pop-ups. I couldn't just look at it live. But uh, you can see there, it's Janet Thompson from, I think this is Crosswalk.com's website. Why is the church going dark? And I just thought this was interesting. It's just a an insight into the fact that this woman... I think she's stuck in, she's confused because she, I don't don't know if she's diagnosed what's going on with the church, but she says, why is the church going dark? Recently, we visited a church, not too different from some other churches I've visited. Maybe this even describes your church. It was dark, no windows, and the only bright lights shining were on the stage. People entered the dimly lit, mostly dark rows of chairs and found their seats. Some pulled out their cell phones and started texting. I wondered, as I always do when I enter a similar church, will they turn up the lights so I can see my Bible when the sermon starts? They didn't. As we began to worship and song and the lyrics appeared on the screens, I had an epiphany from the Holy Spirit. The lyrics were much like this song, The Light in the Darkness, which starts out like this um let's see if i can go to the next slide here um there we go in the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was god through him all things were made that have been made uh in him was life and and she says if i can go back she says these are lyrics from a song and i just thought these aren't lyrics from a song this is if they're lyrics from a song they just stole them from the gospel of john In him was the life, and that light was the light of men. And light shone in the darkness, but it did not understand. The light shone in the darkness. So she's going on, the light, the light in the darkness, light in the darkness. And she says, as the words kept flashing on the screen, I thought, Lord, why are we singing about you being the light in the darkness while standing here in almost complete darkness? This just didn't seem right. You are the light of the world. You tell us to go into the dark world and let our Christian light shine. And yet, we're worshiping in a church enveloped in darkness. We continued singing in the dark. The word became flesh and dwells among us. We, we behold the glory of the only begotten. So she continues on in the Gospel of John. And again, if these are lyrics to a song, someone should hit them for plagiarism because they just stole it from the Gospel of John. So she continues on. And she says, I know many churches start out in movie theaters and office buildings, but uh, the church we were in that Sunday morning looked like a brand new building. So they intentionally built it with no windows. I've also heard the reasoning behind having the church dark is to draw the younger generation. But this is not a concert setting. This is the church. Why does the next generation want to sit in the dark? The pastor was not a young pastor. He looked like he could be a grandpa. When we returned to our home church, I loved worshiping with the sunlight streaming through the windows and looking at the clouds of blue sky through the window uh, behind the log cross built by our parishioners. And with the beautiful overhead lighting, I could see clearly my church family and most importantly, the words in my Bible. The side walls at Saddleback Church, where we were members for almost 25 years, floor to ceiling windows, so she's describing light. You know, I grew up in sanctuaries where you could read the Bible in front of you, and it, and it was light. And she says they can see to read their Bibles, if they bring them. And then she ends, with so many churches going dark today, I understand why people aren't taking their Bibles to church. I recently wrote about this in this article. 
Uh, some comments mentioned that they couldn't read their Bible in church because it was so dark. The word light appears 263 times in the NIV Bible. Maybe I'm making too much of this, but I know it was the Holy Spirit nudging me to speak out as I stood in the dark, singing about the light shining in the darkness. We know that darkness in the Bible refers to a culture or world that doesn't know or worship God and his ways. It's anti-God. But God is never too exhausted by his light to take care of the darkness, said Pastor Brian Smith, and neither should we. I honestly don't understand why churches are choosing to have dark sanctuaries. I would welcome a discussion to please enlighten me and others who want to see clearly when we go to church. So, okay, let me let me help illuminate, no pun intended, what I think is going on. You don't need lights because you are not the center of attention at a church. You are the consumer. You you are there to receive a product. And and I and I don't mean this to sound cynical, but I don't know how else to say it. It's a it's a Again, you might sit there and think this isn't reflective of my church. Well, then praise God. But this seems to be reflect I mean it was reflective of enough to be written, have an article written about it. It had, and she's focusing on like this seems like anti spiritual. Like, is there something? Is there something demonic about having churches? No, it, there's nothing. It's it's a pragmatic decision. I think she even says here uh, is meant to draw in the young crowds. Um, where does she say? Uh, I think is that third page. Uh, she says, you know, it was meant to draw on these young crowds, uh, but 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 this wasn't a concert setting. This is a church, and I, and I just think, no, you're misunderstanding. This is a concert setting. <laughs> the the modern church that she's describing that sits in darkness, it is a concert setting. She's she has this old idea of a church where people are coming and you can see your, the person next to you because, ooh, that's my friend, that's my neighbor, this is my whatever. And I brought my Bible because I actually read my Bible. So I want to be able to see the Bible. It's like, no, lady. <coughs> you're thinking like like you're supposed to be involved in this process in some way. You're there to see a performance. Now again, I'm not necessarily being cynical about the content necessarily of what's being said at churches. But when the church is a business, you are the the customer coming to what? Receive a product. And so people who've gone to Bible school and they are professional, you know, if you go to school to learn worship, they might even teach you how to engender a worship experience and a worship atmosphere. So what do you do? You turn the lights down low and you've got dim lighting or whatever. Why? Because you don't need to read anything. We'll put the words up on the screen. I mean, it's why it's why when you go to the movies, they don't have the lights on. It's why when you watch a movie at your house, you turn the lights down low because what we're focusing on is this, the, the thing up there. So when you're sitting in a church, you don't matter in so much as you're just sitting there to consume what is up there on stage. That's why the lights are focused on them. You don't need your Bible. We will put the, the Bible verses up on the screen that you need to see. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Like, you can look at the Bible on your phone. That's fine. Uh, that that's, that's, to me, is a peripheral issue. The reason why the lights are down low is because the show is up there on the stage. And why is there a show up on the stage? Well, because that's what you're paying for. That's when, when churches talk about you need to tithe and give, it's because they have to pay the bills. The bills include the salaries for these people who've gone to Bible school and they are the professionals, so they deserve to get a paycheck. I mean, once you see it, it's almost like when you read the article, it's like, well, of course that's why the lights are off. It's a performance. It's a it's a show. It's a it is a concert venue. That's why you gotta have the nice worship music and all that kind of stuff. It's it is a performance, at least in part. Again, I'm not trying to be cynical that these people don't have good intentions, that they are really trying to lead people in worship, but the way that they're thinking is this is what adds to this experience. And so I really think, you know, when we talk about Bible colleges and seminaries and and that whole track of if you want to serve Jesus, you need to uh, go to seminary. The reason why that's a problem is because, first of all, you could be being taught garbage at Bible college. That's one. 
Secondly, it creates a distinction between you and someone who didn't go to Bible college. <clears throat> you are, bes- what's bestowed upon you is in, in a, it's almost like you are an accredited, I, I have a stamp of certification that I am the Bible school graduate. So everyone is like, ooh, this person is, you know, like the science. They, they are an, an authority in this field because they want, people go to Bible college and come out learning absolutely nothing. It seems like it's just amazing. And again, I, when I graduated right out of high school and and went to Bible school for a few years, I came out knowing absolutely nothing, but thinking I knew everything. And to think that everyone has to do that. And and another problem that this leads to is because it, it is, if you go off to Bible school, I mean, how often do you grow up in, in high school and you go off to college and then come back to your hometown to the same setting and then get a job at the place that you worked at in high school or the place you maybe worked at as a young adult? You rarely do that. You you get a job someplace else and you leave and you go take your expertise and your degree and your knowledge and everything that you've learned to go someplace else to get a paycheck from someplace else. People who want to serve Jesus then are told, you need to go off to Bible school and get your degree. Well, then if you got your degree, why would you come back to your church? They've already got a pastor. They've already got an associate pastor. They've already got a worship team. So what you do then is you put out your application, you put out your resume, I've been to such and such college, and then you take a job someplace else. Well, well, what does that end up doing? It, It creates what I've called like a spiritual brain drain. Brain drain is this concept of like in, in India, people who can afford to or have the skill or whatever to go get an education to become a doctor, they come to America, they get their degree, and then they just think, why would I go back to India and make fraction of the money and, and struggle to survive? I can stay here in America and be a millionaire. So everyone who gets educated leaves their country of origin, leaving behind people who aren't educated or skilled. And, and so... The same thing would happen with Bible college. Anyone who would have an aspiration to, I really want to use my gifts and serve the Lord and my calling. Great. Go get your degree. Go get tens of thousands of dollars of student loan debt and go someplace else. Well, then that leaves the church struggling thinking, why wouldn't just keep that person there? Disciple them. Teach them the Bible there. That's your job as the pastor to teach the members to to do the work of ministry. So we're outsourcing it to this factory of producing more professionals who and 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 the other problem is Bible school teaches you a lot of theory. I was listening to a podcast this week where they said one of the problems with this whole covid stuff that happened these last couple of years is you had the expert class the, the people who were the science kind of spouting all of this data but they didn't live on the ground. They would just they would look at numbers on a screen, but you would have people on the ground saying, "This is not what's happening. This is not my experience." I, you know, people say, "Well, you know, statistics say that the mask does X, Y, and Z, and this, that, and the other thing, and that." But then you have people saying, "Wait a second. I wear a mask all the time, and I'm still getting COVID." And my person over there, they're wearing mask, and they're getting COVID. And I'm just, so, like, people on the ground who are actually doing like hands-on, they have the hands-on what's called wisdom, like, you know, applied knowledge. They're able to figure stuff out and say, you know what, we can open our business, but we can be safe and do that. And But the experts are just working in theory. That was kind of a big problem, was it was just numbers on, on, a, on a computer screen. It was all just theory. It was there, but they were the educated class. Another thing that Bible school does is it gives you a lot of theory. It gives you a lot of theology. But you try to take that theology into the real world, and it doesn't mean anything. It's like, you start actually serving the Lord, and you'll start to realize what actually is important. I have a funny story. Uh, people who know me have heard this story, and some of the people who know me uh, lived this story. So, But I always like to tell it, because it's the perfect, perfect illustration of exactly what I'm talking about. So, I graduated from Bible school. And it was a, it, was, it just it probably doesn't even matter. You might not even know this term, but it was a very heavily dispensational school. They taught from a dispensational perspective. And I'm going to go into talking about what dispensationalism is. But I remember at the time when you're learning it in Bible school, you think, wow, you know, 
I'm getting the real skinny on what dispensationalism is, and everyone who's not a dispensationalist, they're just an idiot, you know, they're not as smart as us, they're like second class Christians, and and so, man, we graduated, and it's just everything, it's just, if your church is not dispensationalism, you need to teach them dispensations, you need to, just everything, all this theory that we have, and then I started to do ministry, seven, eight years later, I started to disciple some young men, see some of them come to faith in Christ, and I started discipling them. And, and one young man who who had a lot of issues, and but he had been walking with the Lord for about four years, and we'd been discipling him, myself and, and our churches kind of corporately, and we had seen the Lord deliver him from so many. I mean, he was like, I always tell people, if you meet him now, based uh, compared to what he was, it would you be wouldn't even see him as the same person. The Lord had done amazing things in his life. And so we were sitting here at the ministry house and me and him and another guy that was living here at the time was uh, one of them found a, a textbook from college. It was tucked away in a box somewhere because I wasn't reading this book anytime soon, but it was dispensationalism by dispensationalism by Charles Ryrie. And this guy pulled out this book and he says, you know, what the heck is dispensationalism? And I said, oh, okay. So it's this concept and, and they both sit down on the couch and I, and I start to explain what dispensationalism is and I get about a minute and a half into it and I realize I've been discipling this guy for four years. My church has been discipling him for four years. The Lord has grown him so much so that it's, I mean, it's the word miraculous would describe uh, his situation. I mean, it was incredible. And I just, it just hit me. I said, I've never once felt the need to teach him what dispensationalism is. That's how unimportant this stupid garbage I learned in Bible school was. It meant nothing to him. And I even said, after about a minute of explaining, I said, this is so stupid. And I explained why it was stupid, like I just did to you. And and he goes, well, I mean, what is it? I'm just curious. And so I explained what dispensationalism was. It's a way of interpreting the Bible and reading the Bible. It's kind of a a hermeneutic way to study the Bible. And I kind of explained what it is, and he said, hmm, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I probably agree with that. And then we moved on, and <laughs> it was, but it just hit me. I was like, why did we spend an entire semester learning about dispensation? Why is it so important to learn that stuff at Bible school? It meant nothing in the in the real world. So it's kind of like that COVID thing. You get these professional class people who know all the theory and they know all the theology and then this is what works and this is what God does and this is what does. That's, and what you become is like the Pharisee where it's like, this is how God operates, theology, input, beep, boop, boop. And then Jesus shows up and just does something completely off the wall. It's like, that doesn't fit into with what we know. Like So like someone who's like a, a staunch dispensational, whatever, this, that, and the other thing, they meet a Christian who's not that and the Lord's using them mightily and it's like, wait, this doesn't compute. How does this, you know? So to me, I just think practically discipling people on the ground and in life, that's where these things are learned. But it's also, it's non-traditional. It's much easier to just pump people into the pipeline of go to college, get degree, get credentialed so that the world system will take you serious. Oh, and by the way, you'll end up with tens of thousands of student loan debt, which you didn't really need because the church doesn't really need you to be credentialed in that way. I think the church would be so much better to stop pushing this credentialism. Sorry, Bible school teachers out there who are listening to me. I think we might be wasting a lot of our time. I mean, there's some merit to some of it, but I think a lot of it, it's a lot of waste of time. It's a lot of waste of money, resources, energy, and it has deleterious effects on the church. It makes people think you've got to be a professional to do anything for Jesus, except for, well, well, maybe we'll let you run the coffee bar, you know, one week out of the month or something like that. But any serious ministry, as far as discipling and leading people and in, in teaching the Bible, uh, anything like that, now you got to be a professional to do that. And so this one guy I discipled, he hasn't been to Bible school and he's going into ministry. And I just said, you, I would discourage you from going to Bible school. You are a proof in concept that Bible school is not necessary. And he is just a product of the local church that I'm a part of. And I'm, I feel fortunate to be a part of discipling him, but I was just a small part. Um, other people invested in him and, and I, I would happily, uh, recommend him to pastor and minister and lead any kind of, uh, 
any kind of church uh, ministry, but he never went to Bible school. So I think churches need to stop expecting this. This is a worldly way of running the church, which then leads to worldly results, like this woman saying, why are the lights down low? Is it some spiritual deficit? No, it's because that's the ambiance. That's that's what draws people in and makes them feel like, oh, I'm really worshiping the Lord. It's creating an experience. That's what draws the crowd in. That's what the professional class wants out of the church, and that's what they're going to provide. They're providing a product. So they're highlighting their product with lights and sound, and you can just sit in outer darkness. That's what you're there for. Oh, and, and give us some money too so we can keep paying the bills here. So a little cynical. Hopefully, though, you realize, oh, yeah, that, you know, you know, maybe your, my church is not quite that, but I can see that. I can see how that happens and, and, and why um, Bible college can help create that kind of an atmosphere. So uh, not a very positive, but hopefully, hopefully a comical uh, take on what's going on, but of a serious issue. And, and so that's what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. And, and again, I would love to hear back from you. Uh, feel free to email me. The email is scrolling across the bottom of the screen right now, Dennis Sotheby at InFaith.org. Uh, hope you enjoyed this episode in this podcast, but I would like to hear your thoughts and your opinions on, on what we've talked about today. Other than that, have a good one. We'll talk to you next time. While Faith and Focus is a ministry of in faith, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of in faith as a mission. <laughs>